So I'll leave the audio off because um, I can narrate it and then we'll just switch into our normal class. Um, but this is one of our trips, I guess, to Iceland in the UK. Uh, maybe if it's the UK, it was 2003. If it's Iceland and Europe, it was 2015. Um, all the geothermal areas in Iceland are, well, the main ones are in, on the Reykjans uh, Peninsula, which is here, around here. This is the plate boundary goes up through there. And I guess uh, this is uh, Semi Esser from the back and a, a former grad student, Hida Yasahara, walking down the street in Reykjavik in May of 2003, I'm guessing, not I'm guessing, it, it is. And um, geothermal waters are so plentiful that they actually use them to, um, to heat the roadways. And so one of the streets here was being dug up and they're putting in these lines, one inch diameter pipes, which were to carry hot water, the surplus of hot water they have in, in droves right here. And so that uh, gets around the need for snow plowing, I, I presume, to keep the roads ice free and snow free just by using geothermal heat because it's a resource that's so plentiful that you can do this. This is Svartskeni, uh, a geothermal plant, just a beautifully clean plant, um, uh, an evaporator for cooling the fluids, the plant itself, um, the field with these insulated um, lines that go all over it, maybe six inches of pipe and maybe a foot on either side of insulation to keep it uh, warm as it goes from the wellhead to the uh, to the turbines. This is Nesvelier, another geothermal site which is close to the historic um, Tingvelier location which was the ancient Icelandic parliament which was here in this rift. No idea whether it was covered or not. Um, then we flew to the UK. This is someone in the UK who had just happened to have solar panels on his roof, Jonathan Matthews. Um, and a bunch of places that we went when we were traveling there. Initially just west of London for that house you just saw. Uh, Southampton had um, a two kilometer well for a, a very low temperature geothermal well which was used for combined heat and power. So generating electricity using diesel but also using the heat from the subsurface to, to be able to get power. Uh, a mill, a tidal mill uh, a barrage across a river, an, out, an estuary, uh, you let the tide in and it turns a, a water wheel, you let the tide out and it turns a water wheel and used for uh, grinding corn from maybe from the 1600s. Uh, the southwest of England, which is a big tin mining area, this is a defunct hot dry rock project, the so-called Camborne um, hot dry rock project probably ran from 1984 till the early 90s. This is the gantry that was put up over two wellheads, sitting over one wellhead and the other wellhead off, you know, 30 meters over to the other side. Uh, historic um, tin mine with a house on top of, top of it. Um, a steam engine trolling down the road somewhere in Dorset, south of Bristol uh, on a Sunday. When we were traveling to Bristol, um, the Clifton Suspension Bridge, built by Brunel, uh, first of its time. A nuclear power plant, uh, somewhere just on the west side of the Severn Estuary from Bristol. You swear that uh, north of Cardiff, north of Newport, I guess, on that map. Um, a thermal power plant burning coal in near Colebrookdale, the home of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, close to where Birmingham is one on that map. And the Welsh mountains and no pictures of it because no pictures are allowed, but a, uh, a pump storage scheme in Wales where they pump the uh, water up to some upper lake at night and let it drain down in the daytime when you need the power. Uh, misty day in the Lake District with wind uh, turbines a defunct power plant, offshore wind turbines uh, offshore Newcastle on the east coast, um, a mining uh, museum as I recall, and that's probably it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that was our entertainment last time, so I'll remove that. So.
So if you want to, to see what the narrations were for that, you can just go back to, that would be 6.2 from 2011. 2021, not 2011. So uh, I don't know if we've got to take care of any business today. We have five people. We had six, I guess, on um, Tuesday. Um, we'll carry on talking about uh, chemistry of geothermal fluids. Um, we covered most of the things that I wanted to cover in that session. Um, it really came down to being able to say something about the magnitudes of the solubilities, what concentrations they'd be present in the, the system. And then with that, we could make some very uh, rudimentary evaluations of exactly what, the, what would happen within that system. So for instance, if it was cold water that was coming in, then if, we, if we're uns undersaturated in both silica and calcite, silica being a prograde reaction, more dissolved as heat go, temperature goes up, calcite being retrograde, more being dissolved as temperature goes down. Then as the temperature builds as you go, so pressures push you across the reservoir, temperature builds as you go across the reservoir, and therefore uh, calcite uh, would initially pick up some uh, dissolved components and then drop them as the temperatures increase because it's retrograde. And silica would go in one direction, pick up its maximum, the maximums are very different from each, uh, are somewhat different from, from each other. Um, and when you take the silica and not very calcite-laden waters out of the system, then as you flash it and cool it, then the silica will come out of solution. You want to get it out of solution before it goes into the turbine, and the calcite will already have relatively low concentrations. You will reintroduce it, it will basically have no uh, very small concentrations of both those components, and then you'll start the cycle again. I guess um, it, as you go across the reservoir, if you do dissolve uh, calcite from the reservoir and then you precipitate it, then you've also got something going on within the reservoir. As you go across the reservoir from cold to hot, you'll be net dissolving silica, so you'd expect maybe porosity and permeability to increase as you go across. Increased permeability perhaps help you get a more mass rate of fluid through it. But the converse is true if you go across with uh, calcite, as calcite will first dissolve, increasing porosity here, but plugging porosity on the downstream side, just due to the temperature change. And so knowing exactly what the temperature profiles you expect to have in your reservoir will kind of inform you of what might go on. So that's probably enough of an understanding for, for this course. Uh, we did talk briefly last time about the fact that we could do relatively sophisticated analyses, and perhaps we'll come back to that at the end and, and close out on that, but have a, a discussion first on um, effects in reservoirs on uh, the behavior of reservoir rocks. So we made the point before that as you go across the reservoir, you get changes in temperature as you drive fluid from, say, a reinjection into the native reservoir, and you hope that it heats up because the reservoir rock is hot. And as a result of that, you'll get either dissolution or precipitation, uh, depending on the temperature evolution. We made the rudimentary um, connection that maybe if you're precipitating calcite, you're plugging up porosity and therefore stopping the permeability, reducing the permeability. We talked about pore scale models to describe that behavior, and we know, I guess, that from those pore scale models for um, uh, a porous medium, the permeability we can describe as porosity and the pore diameter squared over 32, I think it was, or 36. And for fractures, we could have something like uh, the cube of the aperture divided by 12 times the spacing between fractures. So if you get the diameter of the pore or the aperture of the fracture closing, so if you had initially a fracture that was like this, of some aperture uh, either B or D, I guess it was, it could be each, each of them, then if you precipitate calcite in the system, then by definition you'll coat the walls at some rate 
and as a result of that, your new aperture is going to be not as large as it was before. So it's going to be either be reduced by some amount according to the growth of this. And so that's going to clearly reduce permeability, you'd expect in that particular case. And so the downstream part of your aquifer might get clogged, whereas the upstream part would become more open. And I guess if you think that the permeability would go down in this part and the permeability would go up in this part, then if you look at the profile along the length of the reservoir, if permeability goes up, there's less pressure drop across it. So you'd expect perhaps there'd be some implication of that on the pressure drop within your reservoir. So if, we, if these were the upstream and downstream uh, pressure boundary conditions, if you make the permeability larger in the upstream half, but smaller in the downstream half, de facto, you'd expect the, the frictional losses up here to be less, and therefore the pressure drop would be less. Right? Darcy's law is just a manifestation of that. If you have a constant flow rate, then uh, and you increase the permeability, you'd expect correspondingly the pressure drop with space to be left. So this would be flatter than this uh, black line. And correspondingly, if the permeability goes down, if it's constant flow rate, you know from continuity that along this that has to be the case. So if permeability goes down, then pressure gradient has to go up. And so you can make all kinds of um, predictions, somewhat rudimentary, but actually somewhat insightful as to what will go on in the system. And as we'll perhaps close out our class today, there are models available that allow you to look at the couplings between these. You get precipitation, precipitation changes flow rates, flow rates might change the distribution of temperatures, which might change the concentrations of the individual components, which might affect the precipitation dissolution, which feed back on pressures. And so you can imagine that it's kind of a, an interactive system that you might want to be able to follow. So we made the assumption first, or we just made the statement, I guess, that if you precipitate, maybe you expect permeability to go down because you're clogging up pores. And if you dissolve, maybe you're doing the opposite of that in that you're making the fractures wider by dissolving the walls and making them retreat so that if you have net uh, dissolution, then the apertures that you'd have in a different case might be larger, or the pore diameters. Same, same is true. And so perhaps we should examine whether that would be the case. Um, and so, that's, so let's just take a, a tour through a different uh, example to be able to look at that. So this is some work that was done, actually is kind of uh, not so recent now, but it was looking at, looking at the effect of chemical and mechanical effects on the transport pro properties. So I guess transport properties is code for saying um, permeability. So transport properties is really uh, code for what we might refer to as permeability. And to see how they might change as you flow fluids through a, a sample. And so this is uh, the idea. So the top left picture you see is the geysers. Um, one of their uh, recovery locations. I should get it. Uh, actually, if I what do I do? If I do it, if I do it page by page for view, maybe it will adjust. Yeah, so it'll give it one page at a time. So it's a bit more convenient. Not not so large, but you can see it. Um, this is a, a schematic of an experiment at Yucca Mountain in the uh, Nevada desert, the Nevada test site. Uh, and it was to look at the performance of what happens if you put hot radioactive waste in the underground. And so it's kind of a reverse uh, geothermal program in that you're putting cold water in here to be able to extract heat by warming up that cold water as recharge and taking it out. This is you're putting hot uh, canisters of uh, radioactive waste underground. And as that heats, it'll heat up the surrounding rock, and it will change the permeabilities based on that thermal stress that you apply. 
but also on the fluids uh, mediated changes in dissolution and precipitation as they occur around this. So this was a test that was done underground. It was run over eight years. Um, an experimental tunnel, uh, the ESF, Experimental Sciences Facility Tunnel, uh, was a large access tunnel that uh, went out to the surface. This is about 300 meters below the ground surface. The water table was about 300 meters below this. And the idea was to fill up this adit with um, railroad sized cars of uh, drums. So you've seen these black Procore uh, oil carrying cars that you have on the railway. Something the size of that in, along this drift, maybe three or four of them. Those would have heaters in them, not spent radioactive waste, but they're heated by electricity to heat up the surrounding medium. And these boreholes that go above and below it were merely to be able to measure changes in permeability and changes in saturation that occurred as the rocks dried up as these uh, heater um, uh, fluc uh, thermal fluxes were put in here to, to heat up the drift. Uh, ambient temperature would have been 20 centigrade or 10 centigrade, I guess, which is the subsurface. I think the heater temperatures went up to, they weren't above boiling, so they went up to 150 degrees centigrade and used a lot of electricity. And so another place where systems chemically are out of equilibrium is when you start injecting uh, CO2 underground. Um, for instance, in the Slipner uh, field offshore Norway, where the uh, oil and natural gas they bring up has something like 4% CO2. And by Norwegian law, they're required to separate out the CO2 and re-inject it into the reservoir so it doesn't have any effect on the, the atmosphere. Okay, so do I have to do this? So to reinforce what we said before, we made this point that we can talk about the influence of fluid being driven across the system according to the, the flow behavior. So if you like, this was our um, pressure change with length that we had from inlet to outlet. This drives flow through Darcy's law. As a function of this, it also drives the fluids that carry uh, their temperature of the fluids across the system. So there's some temperature gradient that will exist as a function of this, which we drew on the other side as being uh, injection of cold water and recovery of hot water. And the fact that uh, intermediate to this, we have some effects of the geochemistry. And so if we think about our system, when we talked about chemical concentrations, we talked about calcite, uh, initially dissolving from the reservoir into the water and then being deposited. And we talked about uh, silica being dissolved all the way as temperatures increase because it's prograde soluble. This is prograde and this was retrograde. So those are the figures that we had before. The other thing which affects this, certainly in geothermal reservoirs, is that because they're at maybe four kilometers depth, that the stresses are quite uh, large. And so, for instance, if you try and uh, do anything with a fracture, so if you think about having a fracture which you're flowing fluid through, then if you have in situ stresses applied to that fracture that are acting on it, the stress in the subsurface, and you know the stress is equal to um, unit weight times the depth. So you can work that out. Unit weight would be something like um, uh, 25 kilonewtons per meter cubed. And this would be in meters. So you can work out what the, the stresses would be as a result of that. Then if you go to this and you, for instance, remove material from it, then you may be able to make this fracture larger by net dissolving material. But if you dissolve material from these asperities, which are bridging, then you'd expect that the fracture would actually close under the action of the normal stresses that are applied. And so in systems that are at considerable depth and maybe that are stress sensitive, and so by stress sensitive, we know that the permeability of these 
fractured systems is proportional to the cube of the aperture uh, and as opposed to in porous media is proportional to the square of the diameter. So if the permeabilities are proportional to these apertures or tube diameters, then any small change in this gives you potentially a big change in permeability. So that's the issue. And so the influence of mechanical behavior is also something perhaps that we have to, to follow. And so understanding the, the stress sensitivity of fractures in those systems is good. OK, I guess I can do that. OK, that's good. And so one way to think about this is if you have a system, a fractured reservoir, not just a single fracture, but full of fractures that are interconnected in some way, then if you have no stress applied on these fractures, then they're quite open, and therefore flow across these, shown by the intensity of these dark lines, might be relatively vigorous, high flow rates. But if you attach a larger compression to that, then these individual fractures will become much more narrow, much more narrow. And since permeability is proportional to the aperture cubed, then the permeability and the transmission characteristics of this change dramatically. So you go from high transmission to low transmission as you increase the stresses from nothing to something. But also in the subsurface, you can imagine there's no reason why the, the stresses should change uniformly. And so in some cases, you might expect to have a large vertical stress and a small horizontal stress, or vice versa. And the directionality of that stress makes a, a big difference. And so you'd expect that if you have a relatively small vertical stress here, then the fractures that are perpendicular to that vertical stress would be quite open because they're not being pushed down on very much. And so flows across the sample in the, uh, the east-west direction would be quite large. But flows vertically um, uh, in the vertical direction, where you have vertical fractures, which are acted on by these very large horizontal stresses, would be relatively small. And so in each of these cases, if you look at flow from left to, to right, or from bottom to top in these cases, you get very different transmission characteristics. And it's merely um, an indicator that the uh, influence of stress is quite large. So you can also look at the effects of ge geochemistry. So this is just looking at the mechanical influence on flow. You could also imagine the effects of geochemistry. And that's the same as we've kind of alluded to, is that if you dissolve and precipitate uh, dissolve fluids or precipitate fluids, then you'd expect to have a signal in terms of how the temperature would change. I guess I need to use either two fingers or three. And so here's uh, an experiment that looks at those kinds of responses, quite straightforwardly. So the idea is this. You take a core, so you drill a core out of the, uh, the wall of this adit, or you go down four kilometers and you hope that you can recover some core. Um, you might be interested in terms of silica versus calcite. So we've talked about silica, which the vacuolite is just an amorphous um, quartz, and limestone is calcium carbonate. So they're two different uh, mineral types, one prograde and one retrograde. And you could look at doing a mass balance on this. So you could flow water from upstream to downstream, measure the fluid flow rates. Uh, you could capture the fluid at outlet and measure the mass of dissolved fluid in that. And you could also x-ray CT it to see if you can pick up changes on the interior of that as a function of time. And so you could do that without any problem. So from the fluid flow, you could certainly get the magnitudes of Darcy's law. From this, you could get the concentrations of materials, and so Q fluid times the concentration would equal the, the mass flux of dissolved components. Clearly, Q fluid times the density of water would give you the mass flux of water. Uh, so coming back to our equations, power is equal to mass flux of water times specific heat times temperature change. This is concentration, not specific heat. 
And if you X-ray CT it, then maybe if you have the enough resolution, you can pick up these, these changes in the system. So you take your sample, you put it in a core holder, you put it between spacers, you have a neoprene jacket, which you cover this up. You place the whole assembly in this um, X-ray transparent aluminum core holder and screw on the end caps. And then you pressurize the fluid that's inside this core holder so that pressure is exerted on the outside of this uh, black neoprene jacket. And it provides a stress on the core. This core is unfractured. I think it's just chalk. But you could imagine having a core that actually is the same as, as this, that has either a series of fractures, you can see a number of fractures in this, or you could have a single fracture through the, the center of it from upstream to downstream. Oops, wrong way. And then you're able to apply some kind of stress to it. So, yeah, this is a line, so this is it. This is kind of just a, a regular chuck that you'd see on a lathe that uh, grabs a, um, a piece of steel. This is the core holder. This is Kevlar heater tape that takes the temperature up from you know, room temperature 20 degrees centigrade to 150, I think, in this particular case. Inflow through the top, outflow through the bottom, and lots of coils in this because this is the X-ray source. This is the uh, charge coupled device, the, um, the raster screen that sees it. So the X-ray beam goes through the sample comes out the other side and gets picked up on this um, just the same as in, a, in your phone, a charge coupled device that takes up the intensity of the wave after it's, or the, um, the beam after it's passed through the sample. And the sample is incrementally loaded. So if you go to, the, to a hospital and have a, a CAT scan or an MRI, you're static and the thing goes around you. This works the opposite way in an industrial scanner. The sample twists and the arrangement for the beam is just static. So it's just, just easier to, to do that. And all the time, fluid is flowing from top to bottom within the, the sample. And so this is the configuration, right? Uh, fluid flow in the bottom, through the fracture, uh, out through the top. Measure the pressure drop between inlet and outlet, and you can use that to calculate permeability. Um, so if you have the pressure drop measured not on a flow line, but by a, a differential pressure transducer. So differential pressure transducer just allows you to very quite accurately determine the, um, the pressure difference between the upstream and the downstream. So you can get the, the pressure difference between those. Um, you can also collect the fluid that comes out, and you can assay it for its concentration. And if you multiply that concentration by the volumetric flow rate, you can calculate the mass of fluid that's, uh, of dissolved components that are removed. And if you scan it at the same time all along the length of it, you can use that to further uh, evaluate whether it's coming from a particular source. So this is one, the navaculite fracture. Quartz, amorphous quartz, it has no real grain structure to it. Um, it's a natural fracture. You can see iron staining on part of it. You can see it's broken on the top part. This is probably an inch in diameter by looks like four inches in length. Very low porosity. And this is a typical result from the experiment. So you put the sample in. You, under normal temperatures, you apply a pressure. I'm not sure what pressure we applied. Maybe a few MPA. And then you measure the permeability. So if you flow from upstream to downstream, you should be able to m obtain a flow rate as a function of an area, a permeability, a viscosity, and a pressure drop over the length of the sample. So of this, you know everything except for permeability. So you could rearrange this in terms of permeability as permeability being equal to volumetric flow rate, viscosity, the length of the sample, the area, and the pressure drop. So you know all of these because you're either measuring or prescribing them. So you can get the permeability. And if you have the permeability, you can convert that 
to b cubed over 12s, or also b squared over s, over 12 rather. And so if you measure flow rate, you can convert that to permeability. If you can get permeability, you can convert it into an equivalent aperture. So that's all that's registered on here. Apertures are changing in the experiment. And here's the curious thing. It starts off very small, 12 microns. These are micrometers in, in aperture. So the net separation between these two parts is starts off at something like 12 microns. And shown here are, at least in the early parts, uh, these, these triangles, are actually the concentrations of silica in parts per million. So one part per million, so it would be one uh, milligram per liter, I guess, from what we talked about last time. So 10 to the minus 6. So they're very small concentrations. It's a very uh, low temperature. But here's the curious thing. As your net dissolving material between upstream and downstream, the permeability, curiously, is going down, or the aperture is going down. And so the only real way to explain that is that you have a sample that is kind of propped open by its contacts. Well, the uh, one rational way to explain it would be. And then as you're flowing water through here, from upstream to downstream, then potentially what you're doing is your net removing material from the asperities that keep it open. So that as you remove that material, maybe the fracture converges. And if I draw it a bit larger, the bottom fracture moves up by doing this. Not doing a particularly great job. So now the, the region that is able to flow is given merely by this red area, which is in here. Originally, it also included the stuff below the black line, but ultimately, now the, the aperture is diminished. And so if you think about that, then that's a viable method. It just requires that the, the dissolution preferentially occurs on these bridging fractures and not on the free faces, because if it was on the free faces, it would go in the other direction, right? If you had an increase in permeability. So in this particular experiment, all we're doing is we're raising the temperature from 20 to 80 and holding it for, looks like, uh, the order of two days. So these are hours. So this would be um, 168 hours in a week. So this is one week, roughly. And again, over time, as you change it, then the, the, um, the aperture goes down. You increase the temperature then to 120 degrees. Uh, and again, the aperture goes down. And to 150, it does the same. And so sometimes things aren't always what you expect. We're net dissolving material. We don't have any data for the dissolution out here, but presumably it's uh, dissolving. If it's dissolving quite uh, at high rates, at relatively low temperatures, from the behavior of quartz being a prograde reaction, it should be larger, even though we don't have data at 150 and 120. And therefore, this behavior is being explained by that. So we shouldn't always expect, we should sometimes expect unusual behavior. If you plot that same data that we just looked at, aperture change versus time, this was 200 hours. And I think this is 1,000 hours with a break in it. And if you plot the gradient of this curve, so this is aperture, if, and this is time, and if you plot dB dt, so it's just, this would just be the, this curve here, this would be dt, and this would be dB, you get some kind of trace. And that's useful because if you know the rate at which it is um, closing, so if you think of your fracture, instead of being like it was before, just as divided into two parts, like this, 
So if you take what was our idealization of a fracture that looked like this in context, and you instead plot the open parts and the closed parts as asperities, then you'd imagine that if you want this to close, you have to plane a certain amount of material off here. And that material, if it's planed off here, has to be put in solution and would arrive downstream dissolved in water. And so if you can, for instance, calculate what this aperture is at every time, say by measuring the permeability, converting permeability to an aperture, then you could certainly convert that aperture changing with time to a magnitude. And this change in aperture with time as a function of this contact area should give you a volume that you'd expect to see coming out of your sample dissolved in water. And so you could take this observation from the experiment. A measurement of aperture change with time gives you a deterministic value of this dBdt. And you could compare it with the results you get from applying a model based on that. And so if you do exactly what we said before, that you allow this to remove a certain amount of mass given a given contact area of the, of the asperities, then you can plot for different rates of recovery, which are recovered in the outlet at different temperatures, a ballpark in the corresponds in some degree with the magnitudes that were measured in the experiment. And so all this is saying is that the magnitudes that you calculate um, based on the fracture closing and the permeability of that fracture defining that aperture is pretty close to the magnitudes that are independently measured just by the concentrations that are recovered from outflow in the, the downstream reservoir. That's really all we're attempting to do. So the other way you can try to look at this is also to look at the CAT scan results. And so the problem there is that uh, this sample, um, I think it was around about two and a half, an inch sample, inch diameter sample. So the diameter of this was of the order of 2.5 centimeters. Can I write on here? No, I can't. And so if it's 2.5 centimeters, did one do that? What is that? So if it's 2.5 centimeters, that's uh, 25 millimeters. And so the raster of these uh, CAT scanner is usually defined in terms of the number of uh, voxels it has. So the best resolution you can get is given by whatever the, the raster size is. And so this one, sometimes it's 2,000 by 2,000. This one happened to be 1,000 by 1,000. Which means, just like your TV, uh, 1080p means um, 1080 lines. So this would be 1,000 lines in this direction, 1,000 lines in this direction. And so that means that the maximum resolution that you can have is a thousandth of 25 uh, millimeters. So the best resolution that you can get would be 25 microns. And so if you take this part of the fracture, which is a broken part of the fracture, and look at a scan across that, you can get the upper and the lower parts. You can get them dry and wet and at different temperatures. And you can try and resolve exactly what's going on, whether it's net dissolving or precipitating. But the problem, of course, is that the changes in aperture that we're measuring are something of the order, well, it's white so you can't see it, are something of the order of 12 microns. So this is 12 microns. And we just said that our resolution was something for one pixel was something like 25 microns. So even though you can see a very strong hydraulic response resulting from this, you're not able to resolve really what's going on, except at this perhaps open part of the fracture, where these different curves represent the, the tracking of the surface under these different conditions. But CAT scanning isn't very useful in that particular uh, circumstance. If you take thin sections after you've um, run the test, uh, then you just take uh, a slice of the rock with the fracture either side, this is the fracture that exists down the middle. 
It has these contact points, which are the asperities that are closing up. You can zoom in to see what these asperities look like. Their portions of them are dissolved. And you can see that the fracture perhaps is more open pre-test and less open post-test, suggesting that you're getting net dissolution. These bridges are shrinking, allowing the two halves of the fracture to go together, and as a result of that, allowing the, the permeability change. And so you can apply models to do that. Uh, the models are pretty uh, straightforward in broad uh, outline. The idea is that if you have uh, two grains of quartz which are in contact, then as a result of applying this stress, the localized stress that you have here is amplified by some amount. So sigma L um, multiplied through by this uh, width has to equal the overall stress multiplied by this total length here. Um, growing diameter, D. D is certainly bigger than W, so you can get the magnitude of this stress. It'll just be amplified in the ratio of these two lengths, or these two areas. So if this area here is a tenth of this area here, the stress here will be ten times larger. And so the implication of having a larger stress is that uh, preferentially it will dissolve before the parts of the uh, pore which are unstressed. And so if it dissolves preferentially, then what will happen is it will go into solution on this fluid which is present in the inter interface. It will travel from high concentration to low concentration in the pore, and then potentially it will precipitate on the pore surface. But the net influence is that if you're scraping it off from this point contact, then this point contact will be progressively fatter as it becomes closer. And of course, these grains will get closer and closer. And of course, the pore volume that you have here will be reduced as both the mechanical deformation of these two grains in contact close, making it smaller, but also as a function of plating the dissolution, sorry, the precipitation products on the boundary will also reduce the pore volume by coating the, uh, the grain surfaces. So this is what would happen in a porous medium. If you have a fracture, it's behaving in the same way. It's just that these point contacts, instead of being between grains, are actually these bridging asperities. And so as you dissolve preferentially the bridging asperities, you close the aperture of the fracture by some amount. And if you do that, you'd expect that the permeability of this would go down. Exactly the effect that we're seeing, apparently. You can write a model to do that that takes this dissolution from the interface, which defines how much mass is dissolved as a function of things like the stress that you apply, the diameter of the particle, temperature, gas constant, uh, dissolution coefficient and the density of the uh, quartz. It doesn't matter what those terms are, but you can define what that mass rate of dissolution is. You can calculate the rate according to Fick's law that it's carried along the boundary. So it moves along this interface by diffusion. And so if you looked, for instance, at the, the distribution with radius of concentration, you'd find out that it looked something like this. High concentrations in the middle because you're dissolving it under stress, goes into solution, can't get out except by di diffusing along this interface layer of fluid, and that's a finite diffusion uh, uh, pathway. And so if you produce a lot of mass here, it can't get out fast enough, and so the concentration within the fluid builds up and then drives this uh, process. And then once it gets into the uh, pore, then it precipitates at some. So you generate it at some rate, you transport it at some rate along this interface, and then you precipitate at some rate given by the concentration of the fluid in the pore, the equilibrium concentration. So the equilibrium concentration is where you get neither dissolution nor pre precipitation. And so the reason for this minus sign is that 
if the pore concentration is greater than the equilibrium concentration, then it will precipitate because it's oversaturated. And if the pore concentration is less than the equilibrium concentration, it will dissolve the wall from the pore. And so you can rationalize that. And so if you do that uh, with a simple model that allows you to do that, then you can represent uh, other experimental results. So these experimental results are for taking a, a bead pack of grains, um, putting them under some stress, I think uh, 70 megapascals, so relatively high stress, uh, with water, and leaving them for um, half a year, 200 days, and looking at the change in porosity. And so what you'd get is compaction of this, the pressure in this is, is not changing. It's the same pressure all the time. So all the compaction that you're generating is due to one particle being dissolved as it interfaces with the other one and removing this mass onto the surrounding material. And so uh, the data are the, um, the dots, the black dots here. The predictions are from running a model like we looked at before, that looks at dissolution, diffusion, and precipitation. And you can follow the behavior relatively accurately just by following those processes. Um, this represents the change in concentrations that are measured. So this is the porosity. So you'd measure the change in volume, external volume of this as it compacts. This represents the fact that as you apply stress to this, the concentration of silica increases from 150 parts per million to 250 because the equilibrium concentration under stress is larger than uh, ambient, uh, ambient stress. So. so if you can do that, then you can apply some more sophisticated models to look at dissolving that material from interfaces. Um, again, defining the change in aperture occurring as you uh, dissolve material. So you'd think that if you have a fracture that initially is unstress, the black areas are the contacts between the top half and the bottom half of the fracture. This happens to be a fracture that's been scanned. And the, if you apply no stress, there are basically no contact areas. You apply stress to them, the contact areas grow, and they continue to grow. So as you increase the stress that you apply, the aperture of the sample goes from a relatively high number to a relatively low number. And concomitant with that, the contact area, as given by the white areas versus the dark areas here, this is all white. There's almost no dark area, so the, con the contact is almost none. Here, this is maybe it's 50 50. And if that's the case, this is the contact area. And the aperture that fits with that, the closure between the ups upper and the lower fractures, would be relatively small aperture. So this is just a, a digital model from looking at profiling the top and bottom halves with a profiler, moving them together so that they interpenetrate and the contact area grows as you move them close together. And you can calculate both the separation between the top and bottom parts and also the contact areas just by allowing them to, to move into each other. And that's all that's, all that's basically done here. And if you do that, you can attempt to replicate exactly the kinds of behaviors that we saw in the experiment, where the experimental data are the dark um, dots, and the uh, model data are the white dots trying to replicate these individual um, episodes, just by looking at that as a, as a process. So mo moderately uh, useful model to do that. You can. If you have a model that represents those behaviors, of course, the value of a model is that you can apply it to a system where you don't have the results, you don't have experiments. And so you could do a couple of different thought experiments. One is that you could apply a stress to the fracture and change the temperature. And so if you have a temperature of 80 degrees centigrade in the water, and then you increase it to 150. And then you increase it to one, 200. Then you see that you get some influences, two influences, I guess. One is that you change the aperture 
by allowing it to dissolve more of the quartz under an increased temperature and a steady stress. And as you increase that temperature, you dissolve more of the quartz and so the, the top and bottom can grow together more completely. You also change the rate at which it happens. So at higher temperatures, reactions progress much more quickly. And therefore, even though you end up at roughly the same place, you get to that same place much earlier in 100 days versus 1,000 days. So the opposite thought experiment is to keep the temperatures constant, but to increment the stresses from 2.5 to 5 to 10 MPa. And then you get the same behavior. Um, at low stresses, it's slower because you're not dissolving so quickly. High stresses, it dissolves more quickly. But also there's a net impact that under higher stresses, you get more closure occurring because you have a higher load on this wavy surface. So you think that if even stuff wasn't being dissolved, if you apply a stress on this, you'll force these contacting asperities, which are quite soft, to kind of move into the, the wall on the other side, allowing this interior part to get smaller. So that's all that's happened here. So in this case, you see a difference between 2.5 at the top and 10 MPa at the bottom in terms of these red dotted lines and they roughly asymptote the same magnitude in this particular case. Uh, you can do similar kinds of experiments on um, pro, uh, retrograde samples. So this is calcium carbonate, not at high temperatures, but again looking at a much more detailed um, monitoring of the amounts that are dissolved as a function of time. So this is the calcium uh, and magnesium uh, that come out, mag out of the system. Uh, looking at changes in pH as you get dissolution, as you part, pass initially regular groundwater and then followed by distilled water through the system. And you get these rather strange behaviors. So. Initially, as you put groundwater through the system, your net dissolving components that are coming out at different times through these first 900 hours, and permeability is going down, presumably something like we did before, you're um, dissolving the asperities preferentially. You then switch it to much more reactive water. So groundwater would, tap water would have uh, dissolved ions in it, and so it'd be less prone to dissolve than if it's distilled water. As you introduce distilled water, it vastly increases the rate at which it dissolves, um, uh, as shown by, by this trace here. And the permeability goes down. But as it reaches some kind of minimum, all of a sudden the permeability starts going up again. And so the mechanism here is that if you could imagine, I guess you could think about a thought experiment, that if you're net dissolving from the asperities, then you'd cause this lower part of the fracture to grow into the upper part. And therefore, as a result of that, you'd reduce the aperture according to the profile of this lower fracture moving up into this. So this was how you'd expect to get this. And if you increase the rates of dissolution of these asperities, you'd also get this behavior up to this point. But at some point, then maybe your fracture is looking like, if I can draw it roughly the same, maybe your fracture is looking like this. So the only parts where you have material flowing are in these parts which aren't um, contacting. Most of the rest of the fracture is asperity on asperity. And so now, if you look at these uh, models for trying to dissolve components away from the contacting asperities, now this contacting asperity, this length here, is very large. And if it's very large, it has to carry the, the dissolved components a very long distance. And so since it's a diffusive process, 
if you double the magnitude of the, of the length of this, you'll quadruple the time it takes, your, or you'll quarter the rate at which you transport material along there. And so at some stage, because the rate at which you can move material along the interface is reduced because the interface is very long, so now the diffusion length is relatively long, so now the rate at which you can potentially remove material from this flow conduit, so you think about this little red circled portion here as being just a capillary tube which is isolated, having flow along the length of it, now the diffusion length to this is very long in bringing dissolved components from these contacting asperities. So that flux is essentially zero. But the flux that you could imagine dissolving off the walls of this conduit is relatively large compared to this other flux. So your net dissolving material, but the source of that dissolved material is not from the bridging asperities anymore, but it's from the free faces that allow you to do that. So you could think of this switch as being a switch from behavior which the asperities are preferentially dissolved, allowing it to close because they're under stress and therefore um, the rate of dissolution is uh, increased over the faces. But as the contact area grows, one, it's longer for the dis dissolution to get from the center of the fracture to the pore. And secondly, the contact area is larger, so the driving stress that's making that happen is also smaller as well. So both are reducing the rate at which material is being driven towards the pore. And if that's the case, then even if you free face dissolve at whatever you were dissolving before, now potentially the dissolution from the walls of this outpace the supply of material here. If the dissolution from the walls outpace that supply, then this will grow. And so if it grows, then the permeability potentially goes up here. And so you can think of this as a difference between two different mechanisms by which you're driving behavior. And you can try and develop models to do that. You can try and CAT scan it, both at one hour and after 1,400 hours. So I guess this is something like uh, 10 weeks, right? 168 hours in a week. So, And you can see something in this. This is the same uh, 2.5 centimeter core that you have with a raster of a thousand pixels across it. So each one of these individual pixels is a, a thousandth, is a, well, is 25 microns for each one of these dots. So you can see it better in this because we have a larger and more prominent fracture. And you can try and um, follow the behavior in terms of aperture or permeability as it reduces and then spontaneously increases and also do that while we're also um, following the changes in concentration within the fluid, some of which we have measured and some of which we try and represent by, by modeling. And so you can apply moderately sophisticated models to do that. You can use other fractures. This is just another example doing lots of different things to the fracture. Um, flowing in one direction, reversing flow, uh, changing temperatures uh, in these different bands. All the temperatures up to this point are 20 degrees centigrade, and then from this point onwards up to 40 and then 80 degrees, and getting strange behaviors that allow you to check your ideas of exactly what's going on, and then attempting to model it by looking at the same kind of models we've talked about, where the loading on individual asperities allows you to calculate the mass of fluid that's produced on the asperities, the mass of, flu of, of dissolved mineral, the mass of mineral that comes from the asperities, the mass of mineral that comes from the fee faces, and then try and represent that behavior by complex models that represent the, that follow it in time, just to, to be able to honor both the aperture data, the permeability data, if you like, and also the changes in concentration within the outlet as they evolve over time by distributed parameter models. And then here uh, at the end, what you could do, uh, because you have maybe um, a profile of the fracture before the test, uh, 
Maybe you can do a profile after the test, but also you can do something to constrain what the profile looks during the test. And Wood's metal is just an alloy, a bit like silver solder, which is um, maybe has a melting temperature of 50 degrees centigrade, is a metal at room temperature, but means that you can cast it into the fracture and um, allow it to solidify as it the fracture changes to um, to room temperature. And then I think in this well, not I think in this particular case, then what we did was we used hydrofluoric acid to dissolve away all of the the rock in the fracture to be able to be left with the cast. And this was just a um, a CT image of the cast to be able to pick up the thickness of that cast. And that allows you to constrain behavior. And I think this is just um, commenting on these same things we talked about. So the idea is that um, in a geothermal reservoir, the system is put strongly out of equilibrium. So in the ground, maybe it exists at 250 degrees centigrade. It has an equilibrium stress which is applied on it. It's been like that for thousands of years, not affected by anything else. And all of a sudden you come along and you put a couple of drill holes down, injection point and recovery point, and then you start injecting fluids. And so the same behaviors that we talked about before is that the original system, I guess in terms of what it would look like, is that initially the system would look like this. So initially the fluid pressure might be some equilibrium magnitude. The fluid temperature might be some equilibrium magnitude. And the concentrations, I guess, would be at whatever those magnitudes would be. Right? So if the reservoir is at 250 degrees centigrade, then the magnitudes of the concentrations at those magnitudes would be uh, 8 millimolar silica and 0 0.05 millimolar calcite under these uh, temperatures. And so those would be the initial concentrations and those would be uniform throughout the reservoir. Concentration of silica concentration of calcite, and they'd be uniform. You'd expect them to be uniform. So now you come along and you start injecting fluid at the upstream portion of the reservoir. And as a result of that, the fluids can't uh, escape quickly enough, so the pressure will rise here. You want to drive the recovery of fluids at their production well, so you'll depress the fluid pressures here to be able to drive flow, and you'll end up with a new regime. So initially, you've changed the pressure distribution by some amount. Uh, it might be rising, raising it by a, a megapascal and dropping it by a megapascal. You're injecting cold water. The water might be 100 degrees centigrade, or it might more likely be 50 degrees centigrade. So you're, if you're net moving fluid along here, you have to be injecting fluid in here, just by Darcy's law requires that. And that temperature of fluid has to be some temperature. It's probably going to be ambient fluid temperature on the surface that you've uh, chilled your recovered fluid to, and you're re-injecting it to be able to maintain your reservoir. So now the injection temperature is some small magnitude, and as it transits across the reservoir, it gets raised by the temperature of the rocks to being, hopefully, hot as your reservoir, because this is your feed that you want to use in the plant. So you've changed spatially the distribution of pressure, you've changed spatially the distribution of temperature, and therefore as a result of that you've changed spatially the equilibrium concentrations of these minerals, and that will evolve over a function of, uh, of the reservoir to either give you uh, dissolution or precipitation within the reservoir, and as a function of that, the permeability of this system can change, and it will feed back into a magnitude of permeability that is modified, which changes the flow pressure distribution, which changes the flow velocity through the system,
which changes the rate at which cold water is driven through the system and the rate at which cooling will occur, and it will reorganize this profile of temperature, and so there's continuous feedback. And so all by way of saying that what we've talked about today, and we won't go through it in great in any detail, but the fact is that we can look at the effects of temperature, THMC is often what's called hydraulic, mechanical, uh, and chemical. So modeling that's often referred to as THMC modeling, just by the acronym, to represent these things, because we see that they all interact. In the three graphs above, we've talked about thermal, hydraulic, and chemical effects. But we also know that the mechanical behavior is also important because of the influence of uh, the sensitivity of these uh, conduits to applied stress. And so we mentioned last time, and I'll just mention again, that this kind of modeling behavior is all predicated on the idea that we can do conservation equations. And so the conservation is for the hydraulic behavior is conservation of mass, for chemical behavior, conservation of mass, uh, for thermal behavior, conservation of energy, and for mechanical behavior, uh, conservation of kinetic energy as well. And so we can use conservation equations uh, for mass or energy into the system to be able to solve them. Uh, and so they're written in exactly the same way as you've seen in fluid mechanics. Uh, conservation of fluid mass is mass in minus mass out has to equal the mass rate of accumulation, has to sum to zero. For the fluid flow, the hydraulic part in our system, we can do that by looking at the mass rate is controlled by Darcy's law, which is this term here. The rate at which it accumulates is controlled by the compressibility of the fluid in the aquifer. The rate of change of density of the fluid with pressure, uh, or equivalent density of the fluid with pressure, gives us the accumulation. So that defines these two components of this. If we look at solute flow, that's our chemical concentration part. And that, by applying fixed second law, and our definition of advective flux. The advective flux is just equal to the, vol the velocity of flow multiplied by its concentration. So this is a, a mass of dissolved components. This goes into the term on the right-hand side, and you end up with a partial differential equation which has accumulation of minerals, advective flux of minerals, and diffusion of minerals according to fixed law. And that has to equal the reaction rate, which we talked about yesterday, uh, Tuesday. We can use a, a slightly different conservation equation, which allows us to use not mass, but to use energy as the quantity that we conserve. And we can write equations for heat flow, which again allow us to have conductive heat flow through Fourier's law, advective heat flow through a flow velocity of the water, density of the fluid, um, specific heat capacity, and the temperature of the fluid. And they give us an e expression just like the uh, mass transport equation, accumulation of temperature with time, which relates to this, advective flux of temperature with time, is the same as this, and diffusion of temperature by conduction, fixed law, Fourier's law, with time, and defined as a, a munch, a, a, the amount of thermal energy you put into the system. And so all these three equations, so this would be for temperature, so T, H, we haven't talked about uh, mechanical behavior, and C. We can write a similar constraint equation for mechanical behavior, but they all start to look like this. They all have a zeroth order component as a function of time, a first order component as a function of space, uh, 
and a second order component as a function of space squared. And so you can solve these PDEs in various ways to be able to look at the behavior. And so if you look at, for instance, temperature transition across, the, uh, across your um, system, then this is how temperature would propagate if flowing from left to right. I guess it's the same for you as it is for me. That if you inject a high temperature, the opposite of a geothermal reservoir, and the, the original temperature of the reservoir is low, you'd have this thermal pulse going across. It's just that we've talked about doing the opposite thing, which is obviously what a geothermal reservoir is. You start off at a high temperature, you inject a cold fluid, cold fluid goes across the reservoir, and you hope to recover it as it heats up. And so you can model these kinds of behaviors using relatively sophisticated models that we won't say anything about, but it's useful for you to know that at least these physical processes are interacting in some way and that there's a rational way to be able to represent their behaviors in really very complex nonlinear models that allow us to be able to understand what we see in geothermal reservoirs and perhaps predict what would happen in these reservoirs a little bit more in a bit more sophisticated manner than just a simple 1D model that we're alluding to here. Although 1D models are pretty good. Uh, and you can probably make the case that the uncertainties in the subsurface in terms of knowing properties and the uncertainties in the feedbacks in these behaviors between thermal and chemical and hydraulic processes are so severe and really not very con well constrained that simple models that look like this kind of behavior that, that we talked about in detail are actually probably not a bad uh, indicator of what's going to happen within the reservoir. So, so that's all I'll say today. So uh, next time, so that's kind of a segue into what we'll talk about next time. So I've made the case that these processes are really complex and the nonlinearities are quite poorly defined and quite severe. You know, small changes in pressure can give you a big change in permeability and so that effect has a big effect on your reservoir. And so the question is, how do you go and determine what these initial properties are within the reservoir? What's its initial temperature? What's its initial permeability? How does that permeability vary? What is the initial composition of the fluids? How do we sample those? And so the answer is that we do a variety of things at a variety of scales. So we go and stand there, and we look at it, and we see what's there, and maybe sample fluids from the surface, if we do that. Maybe we do geophysics to be able to probe at, below the subsurface as to what's going on and try and use proxies of electrical resistivity or dielectric constant or seismic velocity to be able to probe it remotely from the surface to see exactly what the structure is. And maybe we drill into it and we take samples and we use those to be able to understand exactly what the, the pre-existing conditions are. And we probably do all three of those things um, the first being the cheapest, the second being the less, least, less cheaper, and the, the third being the most expensive, direct drilling. And we use that to put together a model of the subsurface. So starting uh, next Tuesday, uh, part seven, we'll start talking about characterizing geothermal reservoirs as a prelude to being able to say something about the different kinds of reservoirs we have, which are hydrothermal, EGS, uh, direct use reservoirs and I guess thermal storage. So that's kind of where we are in this. So that's all I've got.